Hi, we continue in Luke 21 today as Jesus completes his Jerusalem ministry with the apocalyptic discourse to whoever is listening here. So as we've been seeing throughout this unit, um, Luke's uh, version of Jesus' Jerusalem ministry begins with a five-part chiasm around authority. If you haven't watched the introductory video to this unit, I encourage you to do so, where I go over some of the methodological questions and how Luke has shaped his version of what he inherited from Mark to fit his particular narrative. As we've been seeing, including last video, how we saw how the verses from 21, 12 to 16 anticipate fulfillment in Acts of the Apostles. Today we're going to see the reverse, how what we see in verses 17 to 22 echoes what we've already seen earlier. So after the five-part chiasm around authority, we saw the transition section where Jesus took down the scribes in the harshest possible terms, accusing them of manipulating scripture to benefit the rich landowners at the expense of the widows. And that's what sets up the apocalyptic confrontation we see here in chapter 21 that pits the kingdom of God against the reign of uh, Rome slash Caesar slash the devil, depending upon how you want to look at look at that. And we'll see a number of apocalyptic elements, not only here uh, in terms of um, signs in the sky, etc., but that sense of confrontation between realms, between the human one uh, and his opponent. And we'll see how this echoes other aspects of that we've seen earlier. Uh, so, as I just noted, we just looked at uh, 12 to 16, and I had put at the end of the last video, I thought I'd go here 17 through the end of the scene, but there's just too much in this little scene to rush through it, and there's no reason to rush. So we'll just go 17 to 22 here. And we can see how that really says nothing about the shape I've posed here, which begins in this unit and goes through to this unit. But as I showed last time, I wanted to do 12 to 16 as a little chiasm, and now we see that this part here, 17 to 19, really does continue from him saying what will happen to you and then it switches to what's going to happen in Jerusalem and it shifts over to here. So we'll continue with that today and then we'll follow um, after this next time. So as we look at what Luke's done to shift from Mark, it's important to see how he's changed a number of things. First of all, we already saw how this is a public address rather than something addressed privately to the disciples. So the you that's being referred to, you and your, is applying to anybody who's listening, not just to a private announcement to the disciples. But what's really key here is that what Mark put in code and that um, Matthew kept in code, although he gave a, a hint here. Um, Mark had simply, when you see the desolating sacrilege set up or ought not to be, let the reader understand. And Matthew changes it so when you see the desolating sacrilege standing in the holy place, as was spoken of by the prophet Daniel, pointing you back to that, let the reader understand. But Luke leaves all that coded language out and puts it in plain terms. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, and we'll look at the differences of that when we look up close, but plainly what's at issue is Mark was writing at the time of the Jewish-Roman war from 66 to 70, giving advice to Jesus' followers what they ought to do when the Romans uh, enter Jerusalem and put it under siege, and this according to Chet Myers. Matthew writing after that is certainly showing how the destruction of Jerusalem is a prophetic fulfillment, just as it was the first time when Jeremiah had predicted it would be destroyed because the, the leader and Judah were not faithful. And so he shows that as fulfillment of scripture here. Luke writing after the fact and writing for an audience of young Romans who really aren't that interested in the fate of Jerusalem for their own sake, but might well be interested in what God has to say about powerful empires that operate according to the provisions that I call the religion of empire, which is to say use official violence and exclusion of some groups of people at the, at, to the benefit of others, all in the names of the gods. Um, that they might be concerned it might be saying something about Rome and their reality because they certainly know uh, that Rome was not impervious and despite um, what we uh, cl what was claimed in Roman propaganda as I showed in my revelation series especially around the seals uh, Jesus unveils the lies of empire and shows just how vulnerable they are despite their their arguments the other way and so Luke is just leaving that all out here in the open and he also has another little twist that we'll see when we get to this section here so that's as much of it as we'll look at today. And as was noting last time, what we're seeing here is not in chronological sequence. What we saw earlier, we were told, was not the time of the end. So you'll be arrested and persecuted, betrayed and hated. There'll be earthquakes and wars and riots. But that is not the time of completion. And I note completion not as it's often translated the end, 
Uh, the word for the end in Greek is eschaton, which is what's usually referred to as heaven, hell, judgment, and the so-called last things. But this is telos, which is to say a completion. So it's not necessarily an end. Something is going to be completed. And as we'll see next video, what Luke's Jesus calls the time of the nations or the time of the Gentiles. And so something will be completed, but that doesn't mean it's the end. But it's only here, as we'll see in verse 20, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, now its desolation has come near, and that will lead, as, as we'll see, in the shape of this, to your redemption is near with the coming of the human one. And that presence of the human one, in contrast to something um, happening here, the judgment, the days of vengeance, as we'll see in verse 22, really highlights what we'll see when we look at the intertextual echoes of how so much of what we heard here echoes back to what we saw before. So notice what Luke's doing here. In 12 to 16, we saw he's anticipating forward what we'll see fulfilled in Acts. And now he's saying, I've told you all this before, so if you're really listening to me, whether that's the people in the story or we as an audience, uh, should know this, that none of this should be new. Um, so let's look at that uh, as we go. We'll put this up to, to see the whole sequence of that, and we'll go over it in detail. So you will be hated by all because of me. First, we have to note, and you see below the uses of hate, and I'll show you that in a chart in a second. In fact, I'll put that up now so we can see that hate in Greek and that cultural context is a different meaning that we might think of it now at the end of a spectrum, which at the other end is love, and an emotional range. So love, we can also often associate with romance and flowers and hate with anger and, and violence and gritting of teeth, I hate you. Um, but in the Greek context, this is not an emotional term. It's a question of attachment. Agape means somebody being so attached to the other or the group of the other that the good of the other is preference for them or the good of themselves. Hate, missio, is exactly the opposite. It's utter rejection. So one can do that with anger, but one can also do that with complete dismissal, with a sense of beneath your dignity, contempt, and not even bother. So it doesn't have to mean, I hate you. It can mean, I hate you in the sense I'll just have nothing to do with you. And the point here is you will be hated by all because you're proclaiming a gospel rather than the religion of empire that the Roman uh, government and its supporters would like you to hold. And I would like to note that for the you speaking to an audience here, one of the ironies of history is nobody hates the proclamation of the gospel more than many Christians. And I found this to be true in over 35 years of, of ministry. Uh, a classic example is a Catholic priest in a suburban parish who um, preaches what I sometimes call pejoratively, Jesus loves you, have a nice day sermons, which is to say nothing substantive, kind of a nice pleasant sense of God loves you and don't be worried about it too much. And I asked him what would happen if he actually preached love your enemies and be good to strangers and all those kinds of things. And he said, people would not change their lives, they changed their parishes. In other words, they'd go to a church where they got the message they wanted. Because in our capitalist society, churches are often spirituality product stores. They're places where people decide amongst their leisure time and leisure money how they want to spend it. And if they get good consumer satisfaction, uh, that's what happens. But obviously the churches that Jesus was trying to form here, these communities, were communities of life and love and mutual salvation. It had nothing whatsoever to do with money or capitalism or any of those kinds of things which didn't even exist at the time. Um, so the irony is that churches have been set up in the name of Jesus that um, if they actually preach the gospel that you're hearing throughout Luke's gospel, um, those members would be hated by their other members. Um, and try it out if you don't believe me. Um, so maybe if it's different in your church, great. Put a note in the comments and we'll celebrate a church that actually preaches the gospel. There are some. So, but in the absence of that, you will be hated by all because of my name. And notice the key there, um, that his name is the name that proclaims jubilee, as we saw back in chapter 4, that includes everyone that's good news to the poor, and that's what people will hate you for. But he says, despite that hate, um, not a hair of your head will perish. So let's see those two together. So we've seen hate before a number of times. I won't go over all those. Instead, let's look at what we see here that's relevant to our section. So we saw early on here, um, he would be saved from our enemies. This is in Zechariah's song, saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. So understood right there uh, from the beginning, that all those who hate us, the pious uh, remnant in Jerusalem. And then Jesus says in the Sermon on the Plain, Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the human one. Which is exactly what's happening here. Because of my name, the human one. 
And notice how the continuous here, this is in chapter 6, and so these are not in, in the sequential order in the gospel. The, yellow, the pink parts here obviously are our section here. But notice how there's parts throughout the gospel that are echoed. So not a, head of your, a hair of your head will perish. And as we heard back in chapter 12, even the hairs of your head are all counted, highlighting that God is paying attention to the smallest details, including the sparrows. And the parts that I've underlined here are parts that highlight the apocalyptic context of some of these, uh, these echoes, even in a context a narrative context that wasn't apocalyptic. Apocalyptic. So we see here, everyone acknowledges me before others. The human one will acknowledge before the angel of God. Whoever denies me before others will be denied before the angel of God. In other words, making the choice between the two ways. And so by your hupomene, you will gain your lives. Two terrible translations here that I want to highlight. Back a quarter century ago, when I was working on the book of Revelation, which uses the word hupomene, which you can see below there a number of times, many translators call it endurance or otherwise patient endurance, which makes it sound like you just have to grind your way through it, um, patiently perhaps, but you just have to endure it. But that's not what the word means at all. It means resistance, uh, faithful resistance. It means standing firm. Literally, hupomone means under, to abide under. Um, so it means um, patiently, perhaps, but faithfully, faithful to the gospel, faithful to Jesus, standing firm regardless of the consequences. So in other words, when you're hated, you don't go, never mind, I didn't mean it, or you don't just run away and hide your head. You stand up and stand firm. And we'll see at the end of this section when Jesus says, your redemption has come, he says, stand up and raise your head. So that's what's at issue here. It's not about endurance. It's about um, faithful resistance to the way of, of uh, empire. And you will gain not your souls, a concept which the gospel has no concept of. In fact, the entire Bible has no concept of, which I've repeated a number of, of times in my various videos here. Um, the word pasuke here, translating originally the Hebrew nephesh, means the part of you that it makes you alive from God. So a nephesh was a living being. It isn't just a human being, but all living beings are nephesh, uh, nephesheim, if you will, the plural, uh, because they have God's spirit in them, not just humans. So not your souls, you will gain your lives. Um, and we see how that plays out here a couple of times, both here and in chapter 9, but it also echoes down to here in chapter 17. So we saw here, back in chapter 9, those who want to save their life, pasuke here, will lose it, and those who lose their pasuke for my sake will save it. We just say, not lose their physical life, but lose their way of life in the world of empire and gain it for the world of the reign of God. And notice again the confrontation. Those who are ashamed of me and my words, of them the human will be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and the holy angels. And we'll see just a few verses down in our current passage, that's about to be coming. Notice the parallels between what we see here in chapter 9 and we saw here in chapter 12. Here it uses acknowledge, here it uses ashamed, but both around the question of in the presence of the angels about which side you're on with the human one. Uh, and then we get to the very center of the matter here, where it turns. And this, as my note below, has returning to the temporal sequence in the order that I was suggesting. So when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, it could not be more clear. Um, and um, the siege of Jerusalem was certainly a famous one. Um, the cover picture I put on this was from uh, the Arch of Titus, um, uh, who uh, besieged Jerusalem. And, it, and we see the Romans taking away uh, the key um, the key elements in the Jerusalem temple that were the prizes. And a siege, of course, was the worst possible thing. It meant that if people didn't sur um, surrender, they'd be starved to death or, th or um, thirsted to death, if you will. Um, and that's a, in the end, they came out and were destroyed. Um, but that's the threat that's at issue here. When you see them surrounded by armies, using the unusual word here, stratopedon here, only here in the New Testament, but echoing a similar image from Jeremiah. Then know that its desolation has come near. Eremosis here, and that's exactly the word, the uh, desolation, uh, the desolating sacrilege that Luke left out from the Mark and Matthew echo, referring to probably the Roman eagle being set up in the Jerusalem temple, much like in the time of Maccabees and Daniel, the Seleucid king Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes put a statue of Zeus in the Jerusalem temple and led to a, a battle there. And so some of the irony is here that um, in Mark and Matthew, it's an image of the Roman army and Roman power that causes the problem. Here is the army itself. It's not just the, the symbol of it. Has come near. Using in Giza, as we saw in verse 8, and it's the refrain that we'll see a num another time in our passage, and then again in 22.1, about the various things that are coming near. Um, 
And now when we hear that happen, notice the call is to everyone, not just to people who are followers of Jesus, but those in Judea must flee to the mountains. Let's look briefly at the map to get a sense of that. So here's uh, Jerusalem here, and here's all of Judea, and a modern map with its color coding makes it sound much like more of a sharp boundary than it was in real life. Um, but flee to the mountains. The irony is that Jerusalem is on a mountain, Mount Zion, and as you can see on the map down here, Mount Zion and Mount Olives right next to it, and you can see the elevation lines here to see. So that's where the mountains are. So the issue is those in Judea fleeing to the mountains, but they're certainly not to to flee to Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives, it must mean fleeing to the coast, um, to the Qumran area, um, where the um, where the Qumran uh, covenants uh, were around the Dead Sea. But Luke doesn't specify. Maybe it's simply meant to echo fleeing to the mountains from um, Genesis, like Lot, as we see down here, um, fleeing to the mountains, um, and from Genesis 19:17, which we can see there, flee for your life, do not look back anywhere in the plain. And we know what happened to his wife. And we know that that's not too much of a surprise to us um, because Lot was in the story um, way back here as we see. Just like in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, so it will be on the day the human one is revealed, which is just what's coming. It's again, not shown yet on our immediate passage, but it's coming right after that. On that day, anyone in the housetop who has belongings must not come down, etc. Remember Lot's wife. Those who try to make their life secure will lose it, but those who lose their life will keep it. Notice that we're hearing that again. Here, here, or here, and um, here about saving your life or losing it. So a constant theme here. Um, so those in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those inside the city amidst the siege, if they can, leave it. And of course, once the siege is on, they can't, um, but they have to. And notice there's no city in Greek, just those inside must leave. And finally, those in, out in the country must not enter. Uh, again, not there's no out in the Greek. Those in the country must not enter it. So leaving Jerusalem isolated, much as like you might isolate an infection, um, a quarantine to leave everybody away from it and just allow it to be destroyed. What is that saying about Luke's or Jesus' sense of Jerusalem as the holy city? Well, plainly, it's not, as many anti-Semitic interpreters, whether intentionally or otherwise, have said, a rejection of Jerusalem or a rejection of uh, Judaism, certainly. Um, Acts will start from Jerusalem, and Jerusalem, as I've indicated, will be like a lighthouse, shining the beam of the Holy Spirit out to all who can see and, and be aware of it, out into the ends of the earth. But it's the leadership that are being destroyed, just as they were being destroyed in the time of the Babylonians six centuries earlier. So that's what's at issue. There's no stopping it now. The choices have been made, and Jesus has shown that throughout the gospel, how the leadership have been utterly unfaithful to the religion of creation uh, and have been beholden to the Romans. And so that's why there's going to be a clean slate and a new start within the communities of Jesus in place of the temple. Again, that's not Christianity in place of Judaism. It's a different form of gathering. And for people who didn't support Jesus, they still had a different form of gathering that became rabbinic Judaism. Again, gathering in the synagogues in small communities, much like the followers of Jesus is gathered in what became called ecclesiae or churches. Um, so those out in the country must not enter it. And here's the dark conclusion to this section for the days of vengeance. And we note there that when Jesus called upon uh, Isaiah 61 to proclaim his mission statement back in Luke 4, he ended, as you see down here, with proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and left out exactly what we have here and the day of vengeance of our God. And now it's come. Vengeance can also be translated as justice. I note down here in the echo from Luke 18, the same word, Dekesis here is translated justice will not grant God grant justice to his chosen ones and so what looks like vengeance from one hand on the leadership of Jerusalem is justice for God's people and we see exactly the same thing throughout the apocalyptic story of Revelation get those under the altar and the saints prophets and apostles celebrate the destruction of uh, that Jerusalem whereas the merchants and uh, the sailors and those who profited off it lament and stand at a distance and mourn so fitting the apocalyptic scene and saying it's a fulfillment of all that is written here is highlighting that everything that Jesus is doing is in fulfillment of scripture it's not going against scripture. It's not a new way of being. It's a fulfillment of the religion of creation. It's been there since Genesis 1. Uh, and how that will express itself in particular imagery around signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, we'll pick up at, on that next time. See you then. Bye-bye.